uh, on this. Today, the National uh, Security and Foreign Affairs Subcommittee holds our second hearing of this 111th Congress by continuing our sustained oversight on U.S. efforts in Afghanistan and Pakistan. As I noted at our first hearing, an overriding point a number of the subcommittee members took away from recent visits to Afghanistan and Pakistan last month, whether it was meeting with Presidents Karzai and Sarderi, with our ambassadors and General McKernan, or with NGOs and other experts, was that we're at a unique moment to ask fundamental questions about the United States' efforts in both countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan. The headlines in our newspapers continually remind us of the security challenges we face in both countries. Violence is on the rise in Afghanistan, with coalition uh, fatalities having increased in each of the last five years. Control of the country, or parts of it, are contested by the Taliban, political insurgents, warlords, and drug traffickers. Pakistan continues to struggle with extremist insurgents throughout its west, as well as political flare-ups in Punjab that threaten to engulf the country in flames of instability. Increased Taliban strength in Afghanistan and Pakistan is fueled by safe havens, supply stores, and recruitment centers in Pakistan's federally administered tribal areas that we all take to calling Fatah. Certain areas of the Northwest Frontier Province and Swat Valley and western portions of Baluchistan Province with the pan-Jihadi support from networks developed in the struggle for Kashmir. In this swirling fog of combatants, agendas, ethnicities, borders, and traffic, it is difficult for some policymakers and the public to discern the nature of the stakes involved and how the lines of conflict interrelate. Whether any or all of these elements constitute an imminent threat to the United States national interest, and if so, what response is most appropriate, are issues foremost on America's agenda at this moment in time as we decide what resources and at what cost might be brought to bear in the region and how. This hearing aims to step behind the headlines and allow subcommittee members and the public at large to hear from top independent experts about the threats faced in these countries. The goal here is to try to bring as much clarity as possible, in other words, to try to make some sense of the swirling fog. After all, before being able to answer the question of what we should do, we first need to have a solid foundation of knowledge about what we're dealing with. In Afghanistan, we must be able to distinguish between and identify the goals of the Afghan Taliban, the drug cartels, and the various warlords. What is the relative threat, if any, of each to the United States national security interest and to the interest of others? It is important to determine any role played by al-Qaeda in the Afghan insurgency and know who exactly is crossing the border from Pakistan to join the Afghan insurgency. In Pakistan, we must understand just who the so-called Pakistani Taliban is, who makes up the insurgencies in Pakistan's federally administered tribal areas in Swat Valley. We need information about whether parties are giving al-Qaeda hospitality and protection and any threats posed by Lashkar al-Taiba is essential, as is an understanding of how various groups in Afghanistan may interrelate and interact with the groups in Pakistan. We'll have an opportunity today to explore the myriad interrelationships as well as ideological, religious, and political agendas of these groups. Finally, in an overall effort to better understand the threats posed, we will assess the trends in these lines of conflict, including attack capacity, recruitment, and financing. That may be the other thing. Those of us serving also on the Intelligence Committee regularly receive threat assessments in a classified context. I would extend the offer to my colleagues that I will try to facilitate a classified briefing from the administration to supplement the testimony we receive here today. However, wherever possible, public policy calls for public dialogue. With respect to the fundamental matters at the heart of our policies in Afghanistan and Pakistan, it is important that we offer our members and the public at large an opportunity to hear a public source threat assessment from a panel of esteemed experts with hand-on experience in the region. As a candidate, President Obama stated that Afghanistan and Pakistan should be considered the central front on the war of terror. He has ordered into pa Afghanistan 17,000 additional brave American men and women. He has also commissioned a top-to-bottom policy review. During this time of increasing peril in Afghanistan and Pakistan and strategic review here in the United States, we seek to help frame the discussion with a deeper understanding of the threats faced in this troubled South Asian region. That's what today's hearing is all about. And with that, I defer to my colleague, Mr. Flake. I thank the chairman uh, for holding this hearing and look forward to the witnesses. I'll just make a couple of remarks. Uh, this hearing provides a great opportunity to, to see what uh, some non-governmental witnesses think of the threats that we face in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, we've all we all know that we've spent uh, billions in Afghanistan since 2001. We've seen some progress. 
However, security has declined as the Taliban and other militant groups have reorganized. As a result, there were 155 combat-related deaths, U.S. deaths, in Afghanistan in 2008. This is the most since we've started operations in 2001. Clearly, we need to reassess our strategy. In Pakistan, we continue to spend a lot of money on coalition support funding. Uh, but this effort has yield, yielded limited success. I think it's also incumbent on us uh, to see if the costs of this policy outweigh the benefits. Where might we better spend that money? Does it require more? Does it require less? It needs to be reevaluated. Since taking office, President Obama has already shifted policy in Afghanistan. In uh, February, uh, on the 17th, he ordered 17,000 additional troops be sent there. This will bring our total to about 55,000. That's for U.S. troops. That's the largest uh, number we've ever seen deployed in that country, from the, from, from the U.S. at least. After having ordered the troops into combat, however, the President will result, receive the results of a high-level review. It seems a little backwards. We, we uh, say, all right, we're going to send 17,000 more, and then we'll conduct a top-to-bottom review to see how they might best be deployed, or if we need to deploy them, or if we should deploy more. Um, we, we should have a clear policy. Where we've seen success in other areas, most notably in Iraq, it was after we had a clear uh, defined strategy and then had our troop levels match and had our policy match the strategy that we had, uh, had outlined. And it seems to me that we're going a bit uh, backwards here. Um, notably absent from this hearing is a representative from the administration uh, to describe um, where, where we're going, where, who the enemy is, uh, in what ways do we re need to reassess. It would seem uh, that, uh, that, again, this should be done before uh, deployment of more troops uh, rather than after. Uh, I realize that that review uh, will be completed before most of those troops arrive in Afghanistan, but there's a lot of preparation that needs to go into it. And, uh, and uh, it seems to me that we should uh, do the assessment first. I should note that this is not uh, just a, a partisan issue. It's not just Republicans saying this. Uh, yesterday, the AP reported that uh, John Murtha, who holds a fairly important position <laughs> on the Appropriations Committee, uh, estimated that it would take as many as 600,000 troops to fully squelch violence in that country. Uh, quote, Murtha also said he's uncomfortable with President Barack Obama's decision to increase the number of troops in that country by 17,000 before a goal was clearly defined. Uh, it's not just Republicans saying this. It's, it's people across the board saying, let's define the goal. Let's reassess our strategy uh, before we make clear commitments here. Uh, absent uh, a policy statement from the White House on this, uh, I'm inclined, as much as I uh, don't usually, uh, to agree with Mr. Murtha here, that, that we, we sh we're putting the cart before the horse. We, we should see the strategy outlined. We ought to have the reassessment before we decide how many troops and how they should be deployed. And with that, uh, I thank the Chairman again for calling the, the hearing and look forward to the witnesses. Uh, thank you, Mr. Flake. Thank you for your unspoken acknowledgement that uh, members on both sides of the aisle on this committee uh, are questioning uh, the strategy and, and uh, whether one exists, one will exist, it will go forward. And, of course, we'll hear from the administration in due course, giving them an opportunity, as we gave the courtesy of previous administrations, the opportunity to develop their strategy before we make them come in and testify about it. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, hopefully we're going to have some testimony here today uh, from a distinguished panel, if I, I will just introduce them before and then ask for their statements. Mr. Peter Bergen is a senior fellow at the New American Foundation. He's a national security analyst for CNN. His research focuses on the Al-Qaeda network, counterinsurgency and counterterrorism in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Iraq. And he has authored two books on Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Mr. Joshua T. White is a research fellow at the Institute for Global Engagement and is a PhD candidate at John Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies. His research focuses on Islamic politics and political stability in South Asia, and he spent nearly a year living in the northwest frontier province of Pakistan in 2005 to 2006. And Dr. Paul R. Pillar is a visiting professor and director of studies at the Security Study Program at Georgetown University. He retired in 2005 from a distinguished 28-year career in the United States intelligence community, in which his last role was national intelligence officer for the Near East and South Asia. 
want to thank you all for making yourselves available today and for sharing your substantial expertise, both through testimony and in your written remarks. Your written remarks will be entered in entirety uh, on the record, and we ask that you keep your remarks as close to within five minutes as you, as you can. Although we have uh, an abbreviated panel here today, I'm sure we want to hear what you have to say and we'll be as uh, generous on the five minutes as we can. Is the policy of the subcommittee to swear and test witnesses before they testify? So I ask you to please stand and raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Will the record please reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative? And Mr. Bergen, we'd uh, start with you if you're prepared and uh, welcome your remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Tierney, and thank you, um, Ranking Member uh, Congressman Flake. Uh, I wanted to respond just briefly to, to some of the things that Representative Flake mentioned about the deployment of the 17,000 soldiers. While it is certainly the case that the administration is still in the middle of strategic review, both on the CENTCOM side and on the Holbrook side and DOD uh, generally, um, obviously the most important political event that Afghanistan faces is the election. And securing the election is the most important thing in the short term the American uh, uh, administration must do. Whether, whether that election happens on August 20th, as, as at one point it was planned, now of course uh, uh, President Hamid Karzai is saying it might happen as early as April 21st, but whenever it happens, clearly securing that election uh, is, is a consideration that sort of trumps any other. Without a secure election, you could imagine a situation where a lot of Pashtuns don't vote, uh, then you'd have a very contested situation, not dissimilar to perhaps to the uh, election in Iraq, where a lot of uh, you know, Sunnis essentially boycotted, uh, and we know what that resulted in. So securing this election is incredibly important. Uh, my comments uh, are uh, basically, uh, I have three observations. One is how does the, uh, f how does the, uh, the conflicts in Afghanistan and Pakistan fit into the wider war that we're fighting? What kind of war are we fighting? The Bush administration uh, framed this as a war on terror. I think that was a rather open-ended and ambiguous framing, and we should be more specific about who we're actually fighting. We are fighting al-Qaeda and its allies. This framing is very useful in Afghanistan and Pakistan because it, then we can ask ourselves, who exactly is allied to, to al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan? Chairman Tierney raised the question, to what extent is al-Qaeda uh, influencing what is going on in Afghanistan? And I think this is, in a, sen uh, in a sense, one of the main things we need to answer today. In my view, the Taliban has morphed together ideologically and tactically with al-Qaeda to a degree which is almost quite surprising if you think about the history of the Taliban. The Taliban were a very provincial group of people uh, when they were in power. Mullah Omar only visited his own capital, Kabul, twice in the five years he ran the country. Now and they banned television, and you, know, you know the history. Now they have a very aggressive uh, propaganda operation. Uh, they're talking about the global jihad. Uh, they've made a number of references saying that bin Laden is uh, issuing some sort of orders which they're responding to, which I take at face value. Uh, they adopted the al-Qaeda in Iraq insurgency playbook almost to the letter, which is one of the reasons we are where we are today in Afghanistan between the suicide attacks uh, going up exponentially, the beheadings, uh, the use, a very effective use of information operations against us, etc. So al-Qaeda and the Taliban, at least on the upper levels, have morphed together ideologically and tactically. On the lower levels, sure, there are lots of local members of the Taliban who are influenced because they're involved in drug trafficking, or they have some purely local concern. And these are people that definitely the United States and, and the Afghan government uh, can do deals with, just as we have a number of different deals in Iraq uh, where we have probably a couple of hundred separate uh, peace negotiations with particular insurgent groups. Yes, that is plausible in Afghanistan, but there is a huge caveat. There is a big difference between al-Qaeda in Iraq, and the, uh, uh, which was really a foreign group and was seen as a foreign group group and the Taliban itself in Afghanistan. The Taliban is the guy next door that you grew up with if you live in the Pashtun areas of the country. Uh, it's, and also Al-Qaeda has been in this area for much longer than they were in Iraq. Al-Qaeda, after all, was founded in Pakistan in 1988. Um, bin Laden and Ibn al-Zawari have spent most of their adult lives in and around Pakistan and Afghanistan. They understand the local scene much better. So it's going to be harder to, obviously we want to co-opt, split, uh, or make some kind of deal where you have the Taliban moving away, reconcilable. Taliban. But I, my caveat today is that I think that's going to be a little harder than it was in Iraq, and it wasn't easy in Iraq either. Um, one other broad question in the, in, the minute, in the time I have left is why should we be in Afghanistan at all? I mean, Al-Qaeda isn't headquartered there. They're headquartered in Pakistan. Oh, by the way, do the thought experiment where uh, Iran was the headquarters of Al-Qaeda, Iran was the headquarters of the Taliban, 
Iranian nuclear scientists had met with bin Laden to discuss uh, nuclear weapons before 9-11. And uh, the Iranian nuclear establishment had been leaking technology and know-how to Libya and, and North Korea. Undoubtedly, we would have gone to war against uh, Iran if that was the case after 9-11. But of course, that's not Iran. That's Pakistan. So here is our nominal close ally that is the headquarters and has continued to be the headquarters for the last eight years of these groups that the United States is at war with. So why, don't we, why, why should we be in Afghanistan at all? I think there's a very simple answer to that. First, two answers. One is we have a moral obligation to get it right there. We overthrew their government, and we owe it to the Afghans to do it. Uh, this is the third poorest country in the world, um, and we've already run a videotape already where we basically washed our hands of the situation. It's very important to remember that in 1989, the United States closed its embassy in Kabul, and both the George W. Uh, H. W. Bush administrations and the Clinton administration essentially washed their hands of Afghanistan. And we know what happened as a result of that. Al-Qaeda and the Taliban moved in to fill that vacuum. We cannot let that happen again. So our strategy in Afghanistan is essentially to not allow the Taliban to come back um, and basically give Al-Qaeda another sanctuary, which is, would undoubtedly happen if we uh, basically did what we did in 1989 again. I'm fairly confident that no one on this committee uh, is, is advocating or thinking along those lines to do something like that. But, but clearly, uh, we need to get it right. Afghanistan, as uh, Admiral Mike Mullen uh, pointed out, is an economy of force operation. It's been an economy of force operation. You get what you pay for, and we need to get serious about making it right. Thank you very much. Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Flake for the opportunity to be here today. I want to take up the Chairman's challenge and try to make a little sense of the fog, uh, and particularly the fog that we see on the Pakistani side of the border. Um, and in doing so, I, I'd like to make just two brief points about some of the trend lines that I've observed over the last four years traveling in Pakistan and particularly in the frontier areas. On the one hand, we see a very striking trend toward consolidation of Islamist groups in Pakistan. Uh, you probably know that one of the enduring features of this part of the world is uh, the abundance of ad hoc alliances, and particularly alliances of convenience between tribal blocks, between Islamist groups, between tribal blocks and Islamist groups. And just recently, we saw the emergence of a new Shura Ittihad al Mujahideen, uh, a group of uh, three blocks in Waziristan who have come together to oppose the US and NATO. Uh, we all know the older example of Beitullah Masood's Tariqa Taliban in Pakistan. It's very difficult to tease out what these alliances really mean. Often they are simply uh, sort of branding exercises on the part of, of these organizations more than they are about operational mergers. But nonetheless, we need to take them very seriously, and we see this happening often. We see the consolidation of Islamist groups. At the same time, just beneath the, the surface, we're seeing a tremendous amount of fragmentation. And I really began to pay attention to this in 2006 when, as a result of the Institute for Global Engagement's interfaith efforts, I was visiting some of my Pashtun friends down in a place called Banu, which is adjacent to the North Waziristan Tribal Agency. And it, it happened to be just around the corner from the madrasa where, uh, where John Walker Lind, the American Taliban, had done his studies. And I was talking with my friends and drinking tea there, and I found that a number of them were generally very sympathetic to the Taliban, but they were also increasingly worried about the Taliban. And they were worried because increasingly they couldn't figure out who the Taliban were anymore. Uh, there were local tribal leaders who had started calling themselves Taliban. There were smuggling gangs who had started calling themselves Taliban. There were militants who had fought in Kashmir, Punjabi militants, who couldn't get their um, they couldn't get their jihadi unemployment benefits, and so they decided to go over to Banu and, and become the Taliban in Banu. Um, and then there were, of course, the unemployed madrasa graduates from around the corner who had nothing to do, who put on a black turban and called themselves the Taliban. So it was all very entrepreneurial, but it was also beginning in the mind of my local Pashtun friends to get out of control. They couldn't tell who the Taliban really was. And now if you take this trend and you multiply it across Northwest Pakistan over the last four years, uh, you can get a sense for why this fragmentation has been so troubling. Not just to me and not just hopefully to you, uh, but also to Pakistanis and to the government of Pakistan. Uh, the Taliban movement writ large has, has really spun out of the control of the government. And it's impossible at this point for the government to deal with the quote unquote Taliban as a unitary actor, as one organization. And this is why, at the end of the day, I tend to worry more about fragmentation than I do about new groups, new umbrella groups emerging, which call themselves the Taliban. 
Uh, second point, very briefly, follows from this, which is that uh, my experience in the frontier is that all insurgency at the end of the day is local. And all you have to do is look at a map of the frontier, a detailed map, and you can see that the frontier of Pakistan is this bewildering patchwork of different systems of government, different tribes, uh, different regulations, local grievances, local dynamics, and of course, local groups, which call themselves the Taliban. And to be, to be very uh, simple about it, and we can speak about this in the question and answer, the U.S. needs to be very intentional about targeting its assistance, its development assistance, its security assistance, and its governance assistance in an integrated way to take account for these local dynamics. Um, Waziristan is very different from Peshawar. Peshawar is very different from SWAT. And even though these regions are close together, they represent strikingly different environments. And our assistance needs to be cognizant of that. And we can talk about what this means specifically, but in my view, if U.S. assistance is going to be effective in meeting our core objectives, we need to ask exactly where is the money going, uh, to which regions, and we need to ask how the money going to those specific regions is addressing local dynamics, how it is addressing root causes, because in some areas, lack of development is arguably a very important cause of the insurgency. In other areas, it's, it is a really an unimportant effect. And we need at least as best we can from Washington to tease that out so that our assistance can be as effective as possible. I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Piller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in your opening statement, you outlined a whole host of extremely important questions, and I hope you consider this hearing a success if we get to only uh, a fraction of them. Uh, I'll try to uh, just comment on a few things that uh, embellish on that list that you mentioned. The current conflicts in Afghanistan and Pakistan uh, are multifaceted. They're interrelated. They affect a variety of U.S. interests. Uh, there is no way to clearly categorize these conflicts uh, in, uh, or the protagonists in these conflicts into allies versus adversaries, into good guys versus bad guys. It's far more complex than that. The main reason uh, that I think we're in Afghanistan is exactly as Peter Bergen stated, but I would then quickly jump to the other main interest that we have here as far as U.S. interest is concerned, and that is Pakistan, uh, lest we forget the sixth most populous country in the world, the second most populous uh, primarily Muslim country in the world. We have a strong interest in Pakistani stability and everything that implies with regard to getting the Pakistanis to try to cooperate with us, not just on counterterrorism, but on any other U.S. interest that touch both of our governments. The one other thing I would say on that score is anything that involves Pakistan also involves the Pakistani-Indian conflict and rivalry. Uh, the tendency of both of those two parties to zero-sum everything uh, to look at anything good for one of the parties to be bad to the, to the other one, even though that's not really the case, but that's how they perceive it, means that U.S. policy toward Pakistan um, uh, inevitably is going to affect the, the Indo-Pakistani rivalry. You mentioned narcotics, Mr. Chairman. We'll just uh, note for the record that uh, Afghanistan is the largest producer of opium poppy in the world, used for heroin, and the problem of poppy co cultivation uh, is inseparable from the problem of infrastructure and economic development. Uh, the fact is, in Afghanistan, it's just darn hard to make a, a living growing legal crops uh, that are bulkier and heavier but do not bring as good a return as poppy. And it's also inseparable from the insurgency, the Taliban part of it in particular, which uh, profits from the drug trade. And the one other thing I would note as far as U.S. interests are concerned is we do have already that ongoing counterinsurgency and stabilization effort in Afghanistan being augmented by those 17,000 troops. And so that necessarily entails other operational uh, requirements and interests in involving the security of our forces, their resupply and so on, that like it or not uh, entail U.S. interests that are going to be with us uh, for some time. Um, with regard to the uh, insurgency in Afghanistan, which my colleagues, I think, have uh, described the main lines of very well, I would just further note that you have multiple lines of conflict in Afghanistan that have uh, underlain the over three decades of, of civil strife and uh, instability in that country. You have an ethnic element which pits primarily the Pashtuns, who are the majority in the unstable south and east, and also, by the way, the majority on the other side of the Duran line in the tribal areas of Pakistan, against other ethnic groups such as Tajiks and Uzbeks. And this was a major factor throughout the period of the war against the Soviets and the subsequent civil war. You also have the traditional struggles for power between whatever is the central government in Kabul, 
uh, and centers of power elsewhere in the country, primarily those chieftains and militia heads that we generally call uh, warlords. In Pakistan, you also have multiple lines of conflict that it's sometimes easy to forget. Uh, the one between the radical Islamists, such as the Pakistani Taliban, that now basically control most of the Fatah and have extended their reach into other areas like the Valley of Swat, is just one facet of one of those lines. We may have seen another facet of that same line just yesterday with the attack on the Sri Lankan cricket team, a uh, very well-organized operation in Lahore. But beyond that, you have the uneasy relations between the civilian establishment and the military structure in Pakistan. Uh, we've had a history in, of, during Pakistan's six decades of existence of alternation in rule between military and civilian governments. Basically what happens is uh, one side or the other uh, has power for several years until the Pakistani people get fed up and they throw them out. And they've just done that with General Musharraf having reached the end of his rope last year. But any new understanding between the civilian and military uh, structures and leadership of Pakistan, particularly regarding such things as how to deal with the Taliban, has yet to be worked out. And then among the civilians themselves, um, the uh, acrimony between the supporters of the accidental president, Asif Zardari, and the main opposition party leader, Nawaz Sharif, is as deep and strong as ever, as punctuated by last week's decision by the Pakistani Supreme Court barring Sharif from running for office. One thing that we need to remember is that the Pakistani and Afghan protagonists themselves uh, in all these conflicts do not necessarily see the mosaic the same way you or I would see it. In particular, Pakistani leaders, especially military leaders, tend to view everything through the lens of their standoff with India. That's part of the reason most Pakistani military forces are still in the southeast facing India, not in the Northwest, where the uh, trouble that we're more concerned about is going on. This perspective has also colored and continues to color Pakistanis' views toward Afghanistan and the Taliban. For Pakistan, Afghanistan is part of their strategic depth as they confront India. As was noted, the Taliban is originally a creation of Pakistan, and for some Pakistanis, particularly in the military, even if they realize their creation has kind of gotten out of control, in a way that they did not foresee, the Taliban is still, in the eyes of at least some of them, a useful hedge against the considerable uncertainty in Afghanistan. Um, I'd, I'd close my oral comments by just noting three requirements of any policy review, including the one that the administration has going or any other discussion we may have about setting a new course in this theater. One is, step one, to just uh, determine what U.S. policy objectives ought to be. Uh, and that's not self-evident, even when it comes to the counter-terrorist objectives that are so important. Secondly, we have to set relative priorities among what are often competing objectives, and they can compete even within the counter-terrorist area. For example, we've seen this with some of the U.S. missile strikes on both sides of the Durand Line, which have achieved tactical gains in putting out of commission some al-Qaeda operatives, but have done so at the price of incurring popular wrath that can increase sympathy and support for terrorist objectives. And finally, policymakers have to determine not just the relative priority, but the absolute priority of U.S. objectives in the region in the sense of whether they are important enough to warrant the cost and commitment necessary to achieve them. And I think Congressman Murtha's uh, quoted comment about 600,000 troops, I think General McNeil, the former commander of ISAF, used a figure of 400,000, but suffice it to say several hundred thousand uh, that would probably be required, according to the counterinsurgency doctrine and manuals, to really pacify Afghanistan uh, is a dose of reality that we all need to take into account when we consider any new course. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I, you know, this is probably one of the more complex issues that we'll discuss in national security and foreign policy, and all three of you managed to get your comments done under five minutes. It's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, thank you for, uh, for observing that time. Uh, we're going to go to the question and answer period. We're going to try to figure a better way to do this eventually than the five-minute rule, something a little more free-flowing, but Mr. Flake and I will talk about that in the future. For now, we'll go under the five-minute rule, and we'll try to give as many people an opportunity to uh, ask their questions and have a second round if, if necessary. But Mr. Pillar, I want to start where you left off. And at the end of your uh, written remarks, uh, you talk about the first step in setting any new course of U.S. strategy in the region is to determine the U.S. policy objectives of what they ought to be. 
You say even the most defensible objective, preventing the establishment in Afghanistan of the kind of home for transnational terrorist group that existed there until 2001, is not self-evident, given the difficulty of demonstrating that different levels of U.S. effort in Afghanistan would make the difference between such a terrorist haven being or not being established. And that's in addition to the question of how important such a physical haven is to terrorist groups who do most of their preparations for attacking Western targets elsewhere, including in the West. I phrase it differently, but I've been asking that of uh, General McKernan, of our ODNI, and different people in that. If we're saying our rationale is that we don't want, that the Taliban in Afghanistan is really more of a localized problem, as of the drug, uh, narcotics people and the drug warlords, uh, but the reason we say that we have a military interest there is to stop it from becoming a safe haven, because we believe that the Taliban takes over, they'll invite in Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. who is not there presently, and then they'll be getting back to pre-2011. I think that begs the question is that Al Qaeda already has a safe haven in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. I think that without too much effort, they could have a safe haven in Yemen, Somalia, Sudan, Algiers, you know, and go right on down the line. In none of those places, and particularly in Pakistan, are we sending in ground troops of any magnitude, uh, to speak of uh, never mind 600,000. We've decided that we're going to deal with that wholly different. I think Mr. White uh, talks about some ways of doing that, localized aid and, and assistance, beefing up their security forces, uh, you know, and working on that basis. Why is it important for us, ostensibly then, to have a military answer primarily in Afghanistan when the un it's uncertain as to whether or not we can get to the level that would actually pacify the whole region, when we've decided to handle the situation other ways in Pakistan and elsewhere? Excellent question, and that's why I raised it at, at the uh, end of my uh, statement that you, you cited. I think there are three issues here, Mr. Chairman. One is, um, and especially if, if we can assume we're not going to go to levels like 600,000 troops, I, do, I don't expect we will, um, is that going to make whatever effort, level of effort we do decide on, is that going to make the difference between having or not having some corner of Afghanistan uh, in which whatever level of troops we have, it's not fully covered. Or uh, Pakistan still. Or Pakistan, for that matter, yeah. That's, uh, that, that, that's point number one. But also is the, uh, the further point of just, uh, well, the, the second one that you, you mentioned, uh, if you want safe havens, there are ample opportunities for them elsewhere. And you mentioned two or three of the, the most notable ones. But the third point I would make, the last uh, sentence that you, you, you quoted from my statement is, the, the question of how important a physical safe haven on the other side of the world is for the kind of terrorist group we're most worried about, particularly the kind that would cause us harm in the United States. Recall the parameters of the preparation for the 9-11 operation. Yes, Al-Qaeda did have its safe haven under the Taliban in Afghanistan. Where did most of the preparations take place? In Hamburg, in Kuala Lumpur, and in flight schools here in the United States. So I worry a lot about uh, the continued terrorist threat to the U.S. homeland, I don't worry about it primarily in terms of safe havens in uh, countries on the other side of the world. Greg, would you care to, to uh, react to that? Yeah, I'm going to take a slightly different tack. I uh, suspect that you would. <laughs> I, I think that if you look at any effective uh, terrorist attacks, there's always a safe haven at the bottom. Somebody has had uh, uh, military training or, or, or involved in some sort of paramilitary. You don't learn this over the internet. I mean, look at the Mumbai attack. Um, the, the guys in the Mumbai attack had trained in a training camp in Muzaffarabad. That's why they could go and kill so many people so effectively. Um, so I think safe havens are important. There are, there are safe havens and there are safe havens. Pre-9-11, you had thousands of people going through the training camps. Obviously, we don't want to return to that. The training camps in Pakistan are smaller. They're perhaps 20 people. They're not amenable to overhead imagery. They're in, in compounds. But look at the London attack of July 7, 2005. The two leaders of the attacks both trained with al-Qaeda in Pakistan at some form of training camp. And so um, it is important for us to reduce the number of safe havens, it goes without saying, and particularly, and, and obviously the kind of safe haven of, of the pre-9-11 safe haven in Afghanistan would be, is, is something that we, we must be very careful not to allow to come back. But I wanted to pick up on the 600,000 figure because this is incredibly important. There are 565,000 members of the uh, Iraqi police and army. Iraq is a smaller country in population, and it's much smaller in area, and it's a desert which is very easy to control, relatively speaking. Afghanistan has a larger population. Uh, it is mountainous, so it's very amenable to guerrilla warfare. 
Of course, the United States is never going to produce hundreds of thousands of additional soldiers to go to Afghanistan. But the, our exit strategy, in the end of the day, is the Afghan army and the Afghan national police. We have done a terrible job about, of that. The Afghan national army in 2002 was 6,000 guys. That's the size of a, a small police force in an American city. Uh, this is, so this is where we really need to focus our attention. When we send additional troops to Afghanistan, it is, it is the most important role that they are going to be doing is advising and mentoring and embedding uh, with the Afghan army itself and expanding that rather dramatically. Thank you. I mean, I, the last point you make is interesting that you, we went from 17,000 or 36,000 to having troops there just to be embedded and to train and to do it. That's a whole different strategy than what we're doing now. But also, you know, the, the idea of uh, safe havens being uh, it, uh, a problem. Of course they are, whatever, but I, I think the question still goes through. Do we intend to take a military engagement against every potential safe haven of whatever size? Uh, or is there another way to deal with that as uh, we apparently are looking to do another way in, in Pakistan or whatever? And lastly, just on the Afghan security forces, we've done some hearings on that. I don't think anybody here is very impressed with the likelihood that that force is going to get up to any particular level anytime soon, given the literacy issues, the corruption issues, and the sheer lack of numbers. Uh, of qualified people on that. That's, a, that's an issue. Mr. White, do you want to comment on the general issue? Just very briefly, I would, I would say it's, it's obvious we do have a different strategy in Pakistan than Afghanistan because we have a fundamental interest in the, in the stability of the Pakistani state. And, uh, and I tried to highlight very briefly in my testimony the fact that it's not only the transnational al-Qaeda threat that we face, but we face a number of groups which vector their efforts toward Islamabad. And given Pakistan's role as a nuclear-armed state, as, a, as an influential state in the Muslim world and as a geostrategic state, which has importance to us, uh, th that's also of, of real concern. I think that explains why we do what we do. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Flake, you're recognized. Thank you. I appreciate the testimony. Mr. Bergen, um, when uh, we visited uh, Mr. Karzai in December of 2004, I believe it was, uh, he had just been inaugurated then, and he referred to the uh, the war on drugs there, the war on poppies, as the mother of all battles. Uh, notably, when I was there just a month ago, or two months ago, in December, uh, he downplayed that war substantially and, and even said that, uh, th that there was little evidence that the Taliban was profiting from the, the drug trade, that those who were profiting were somewhere in Europe somewhere, but it really wasn't filtering back to the Taliban. In your statement, Mr. Bergen, you, you mentioned that uh, they're, they're uh, profiting handsomely from the drug trade. Do you want to comment on that and, and, and the government, the Afghan government's commitment uh, or lack thereof uh, to fighting the drug war? Uh, thank you very much, Congressman Flake. I think that, um, I mean, it, it, it's uh, it's a widely accepted fact that the Taliban is profiting handsomely from the drug trade. Insurgencies cost a lot of money to run because you have to pay people to be part of the insurgency. They don't volunteer like terrorists. You don't have to pay. And uh, an Afghan policeman is making $70 to $100 a month. A Taliban foot soldier is making $300 a month. This money is not coming out of magically uh, suddenly appearing. This money is coming from the drug trade. What can the United States do about it? The DEA surely knows who the leading drug lords are in Afghanistan. Think about Colombia. Pablo Escobar was a household name in the early 90s. The Cali Cartel was a household name. Why don't we know the, the names of the Afghan drug lords? Uh, I, I, the committee will surely understand uh, because it, it includes a number of government officials. Mm -hmm. The time for their public embarrassment is over. Why can't we t basically t t say to the DA, it's a matter of, uh, you know, there are all sorts of reasons we, that they're keeping this private, but it, I think the moment has come to make it public. Um, secondly, there is no extradition treaty between the United States and Afghanistan. The Afghan judicial system is a joke. Congress I, I wouldn't be in a, in a presumably able to set up some kind of extradition treaty for major drug laws from Afghanistan who could be tried in the Southern District of New York or other locations. Uh, so those are, I think, two specific things that we can actually do to change the situation. The Afghan government has proven unwilling or incapable of doing so. Mr. White, uh, there's talk in the 600,000 a uh, troop figure has been thrown around that that would be what we need to actually secure the country. Is there, obviously, we need more than, than troops. You have to have a strategy and you have to employ that. And we have uh, the PRTs and we're making a lot of efforts on a lot of levels. What is the, in your view, the, the bottom threshold uh, of numbers of troops 
that the U.S. will have to commit in order to, to give effect to any uh, strategy that might work? Is there a minimum threshold? If, and everybody knows uh, we're unlikely to get to the 600 level. Uh, is there a point at which anywhere under the threshold, why bother? Uh, can, can you comment on that? It, it's a very good question. Uh, I, I want to comment first just briefly on your question to, to Mr. Bergen and just to note that I think that there's a relationship, although it's not one that's very well understood um, in detail, between the drug trade in Afghanistan and the entrepreneurial nature of the Taliban insurgency in Pakistan, this fragmentation that I was talking about. Because when you have a lot of money that is available, then you have a lot of options for new groups to begin and for drug smugglers to essentially label themselves the Taliban and to operate on that basis. So there's, there's a clear linkage there. To the, to the point about Afghanistan, I can't answer the question about a minimum threshold, but I think that I am sympathetic with, with a part of your opening statement in, uh, in terms of the importance of specifying what these troops are going to be doing, and particularly at what level they're going to be operating. Uh, are they going to be operating out of PRTs? Are they going to be more forward deployed at a village level? Um, are they going to be focused on securing major urban areas in the south? Are they going to be focused on rural areas? Um, what do those objectives actually look like? And until we understand a little bit more about what that strategy looks like at a very granular level, um, I'm not sure that we can, we can begin talking uh, about minimum thresholds and the like. I think those are some of the prerequisite kind of questions. Mr. Pillar, do you have any comments briefly? Uh, just the, the other out? prerequisite uh, question uh, to talking about uh, sufficient levels is just what the end state is uh, that we hope to achieve. And is it, is it a unified Afghanistan? Is it something much more fractionated? Uh, is, it, is it one where the central government uh, is one that we would consider a friend and ally, or just one that we would consider has achieved a modicum of stability? Those are basic questions you'd have to answer first. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Foster, you're recognized for five minutes. Yeah, I have a couple questions about um, the possible parameters for the end state that, that we might get to, and, and particularly the economic investment that the international community should think about making. And first, are you aware of any estimates for how much it would take to buy out the poppy farmers? Yeah. Um, the gate price of, of the opium that is produced is $750 million, um, which is about the amount of money the United States pays in its anti-narcotics policy in Af Afghanistan. Okay. So that, that for twice that. So if we're willing to put twice that every year, there's a reasonable chance that we could buy out the poppy farmers. As order it would be of one point five billion. Yeah. Estimate. Similarly, um, if you think about the manpower requirements for a well-trained Afghan army and police force, um, is there? Do you have a, a seat of the pants guess for how many um, well-trained officers you'd need to actually have the central government control the country? Any of you? The short answer is no. I mean, the, the, the 600,000 figure of soldiers and police is correct, and um, obviously most of that would be police. Okay, but is there uh, some rule of thumb for if you just look at, at marginally developed countries that are in fact stable, you know, what fraction of their total population is police force? I, I would just comment, uh, Congressman, that uh, uh, I, I, I'm not going to give you a percentage either, but in Afghanistan you've got the added problem, which is appropriate for you to ask about the officer corps, of, of basic literacy and, uh, and, and other uh, skills, but mainly liter literacy that is required in the officer corps, but not necessarily in the enlisted ranks, and that is one of the main impediments to, uh, to uh, well, no, growing. It's talking about the end state where we put um, the time and effort a generation from now so that we actually have uh, you know, a generation that has been trained from at least adolescence up to begin. I don't, it's probably somewhere in General Petraeus's counterinsurgency manual, but I, I don't know what the figure would be. Okay. Um, do any of you have a feeling for whether the missile strikes against the Taliban, the recent ones, have been a net plus or not? You know, it's obvious they're a mixed bag, but do you have a feeling? Um, Dr. Uh, in, in, in my judgment, um, no. Uh, although it's, it's hard to make a case either way, as I noted uh, in, in my comments. Uh, there have been important tactical successes scored, important al-Qaeda operatives have been taken out of combat. Uh, but we see uh, in, in the press reporting almost every week uh, some of the popular response with regard to the perception that the United States 
is heartless and careless when it comes to Muslim lives on both sides of the Duran line. And that is the sort of thing that can have a much more widespread effect, even going beyond Afghanistan and Pakistan. So my sense is the net effect, when you consider that plus and minus, is uh, it's a net minus. Can I, can I, I, I think it's a maybe. Um, there were three missile strikes in 2007. There were 34 in 2008. There have been five under the Obama administration. So the Obama administration is actually ramping up from the already quite ramped up uh, Bush administration policy on this. Eight uh, relatively senior members of Al Qaeda have been killed, including Al Qaeda's number three, Al Libya. The most dangerous job in the world is being Al Qaeda's number three because there's a constant replenishment of number threes. But uh, clearly, one metric to actually determine how successful this thing this is the number of al-Qaeda videotape releases have dropped. This is, I think, an important indicator because to get these things out, you need couriers, you need people. Uh, in the past year, we've seen, it, we've seen a drop from the record in 2007. So this is interfering uh, with al-Qaeda's command and control. But as Professor Pilar has pointed out, the, there are enormous opportunity costs here. and We have to calibrate uh, recruiting, uh, offering a recruiting tool, tool to the Pakistani Taliban versus disrupting al-Qaeda, which is, of course, our primary interest. I would just say very briefly, one of the reasons that this, is, that this is very difficult to assess is because there is a local effect and then there is a national or bilateral effect. The local effect, which is, uh, which is to say, do the missile strikes radicalize the local population and spur recruitment into al-Qaeda or into the Taliban? And that's exceptionally difficult to, to assess. Uh, the national effect, uh, the effect that it has on the legitimacy of the Zardari government, the ability of the Zardari government to take action against Taliban or al-Qaeda groups, the relationship between Pakistan and U.S. on a bilateral basis is, is much easier to assess, and, and that's what makes me think that this is probably a net negative. But it's very difficult to tell what's actually happening in the immediate vicinity of these strikes after they occur. Yeah. Well, do they, for example, um, make the U.S. appear as though they're a more useful ally? Um, no. There, by the way, there's very good polling yeah. data on this. Yeah. Uh, 2008 poll, Pakistanis were asked, uh, who, what is the principal threat to your security? 52% said the United States. Only 8% said al-Qaeda. Now, clearly, in our minds, that's crazy. However, that is how it's perceived in Pakistan. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Foster. Mr. Mike, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Bergen, you've... Uh, you spent a long time as a CNN reporter. I guess you were one of the first to interview... Uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, and I guess some time writing about him and reviewing um, his activities has been sort of at the core of uh, of uh, what we're after. I would would imagine here is uh, what he initiated. Uh, I think one of your books too uh, details some connections between Afghan the Afghanistan or Al Qaeda link and uh, the World Trade Center in '93. Um, these appear to be some pretty patient people. And Mr. Pilar, you described how their organization was in Germany, Kuala Lumpur, even the United States. They're, they don't seem to have a specific home other than Afghanistan, or they use Afghanistan and Pakistan to, to, uh, as, as havens to, to slide between uh, borders. My first question would be, Given what you've seen over, again, looking at this for years and their activities, uh, they're very patient. I, I would tend to think that they're looking to another hit. They were very successful with, with both the World Trade Center first time uh, during the Clinton administration and hitting us uh, during the Bush administration and taking actually taking the towers down. Do you feel that they're uh, plans would include another, uh, I chaired aviation for six years, a uh, uh, major attack in aviation, since that was such a success, or uh, maybe get their hands on nuclear um, or some sort of dirty bomb to do another spectacular. What would be your opinion? Um, certainly they're patient. I mean, uh, Ayman al-Zawari, al-Qaeda numbers two, points out that it took uh, you know, two centuries to get the Crusaders out of, the, out of, out of the, the Middle East and the Middle Ages. So that's the way they think. But, um, and we know that they want to So create. you're saying they're patient and that they're determined. Indeed. However, I think that they're What, what about the threats? Well, I think, that the, I think the threat level against the United States from al-Qaeda is actually very low. 
for three reasons. First of all, Al Qaeda is, while it's resurged, is not at the point where it was before 9-11. Secondly, the American and Muslim communities rejected the Al Qaeda ideology. Third, uh, I can't prove negatives to you, but I don't believe there are Al Qaeda sleeper cells in this country. They're so asleep if they exist, they're either comatose or dead. They've done nothing. They've so had you many think they've given up or just in waiting? I think, you know, we've had it, and also, you know, the Bush administration, the government in general, you know, made it much harder to get into this country. When we've been attacked by jihadi terrorists in the, t in the past, they've always come from outside. That was true on 9-11. It was true in 93 with the Trade Center attack, and it was true when Ahmed Rassam tried to blow up Los Angeles International Airport. Well, they, they had a whole history. If you go back to Clinton, we had uh, Kobar Towers, we had the coal, we had the bombings and the Saudi, other bombings in Saudi Arabia. We had the simultaneous uh, bombings of our embassies um, in in Africa, so they haven't. And, and since 2001, there have also been additional hits. So, the, to your best knowledge, you don't think that they're working on a spectacular? I mean, they're always working on it on a theoretical level. The question is, what can they do on a practical level? What, what do you think, Brett Pillar? Uh, I agree with everything Peter Bergen said. I would just add that we should not focus too narrowly on the one group, Al Qaeda, the group led by Bin Laden and Zawahiri. Uh, you know, we do have... Well, then it's more of a war on terror than what... Uh, well, Ber well, it doesn't have to be generalized that Terrorism. Much. We, we can talk about Terrorism. radical Sunni Salafi Islamists. Yeah. Just that movement. And whether you have uh, um, Obama in office, Bush in office, Clinton in office, uh, are they any more warm and fuzzy towards the West? Uh, the attitudes toward the West and toward the United States uh, specifically are a mixture of attitudes that would be there because we're the leader of but the some, West. Some are still pretty radical and extreme in hell but on destroying us. Uh, yes, uh, but policy does matter as okay. well. It's a mixture. It's not all one or the Final other. Final question is, you know, what, what should our objective be? Are we get, is our objective to get bin Laden? Are we trying a political solution, maybe to just get some neutrality? Uh, or is this a, this a military, should this be a full-fledged military campaign to, uh, to take them out? Bergen? Uh, in, in Afghanistan, sir? Or yeah, yeah, but well, of course you have the situation up. Uh, we don't real, we have to get permission in Pakistan, we, and we've been going across the border, I guess, and chase some chases without permission. But what is our objective in the, that area, the uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan? I think it's largely a counter sanctuary strategy. I'm not, sorry? It's largely a counter sanctuary strategy, okay. which is not allowing them to have safe havens to which they can train people to attack us or our allies or Americans abroad because the threat from Al-Qaeda is not necessarily on the United States in general, but it is here to Americans abroad. It is, it is primarily to uh, prevent the recurrence of the kind of uh, safe, safe haven and sanctuary that existed under the Taliban prior to uh, September 2001. Thank you, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding uh, this very important hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for helping the committee out with its work. Uh, I returned from Afghanistan yesterday, uh, along with Mr. Driehaus and uh, Mr. Platts from the committee and Mr. Conley from the committee, and I know the chairman was there uh, last week. Uh, I had an opportunity to spend some time in Kandahar province with, uh, with uh, special forces operations that are going forward in there, uh, and, and also some marine units uh, operating there and in Helmand province. And uh, the military has explained a, 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 new, uh, a new phenomenon in their, their uh, daily uh, uh, contact with uh, Taliban forces and actually local uh, uh, Af Afghan uh, fighters. And uh, what they described to me and to the other members of the CODEL was that uh, they are having daily pitched battles uh, they said reminiscent of something you might see in World War II where uh, local Afghan uh, fighters uh, allied with, uh, with the Taliban are, are actually not retreating over the border into Pakistan. They are defending their ground and, uh, and each and every day that, that our units go out there, they're in daily contact with, with the enemy. And, uh, I asked why this change might have uh, occurred, and they said that 
part of it is the fact that uh, that our troops are, are and, and, and Afghan national troops are uh, conducting a more aggressive uh, uh, eradication process in the Helmand Valley and other areas that are producing a lot of poppy and that we're alienating uh, the local farmers. Uh, now I know we have to, I know we have to do this uh, for all the right reasons. But you three guys are pretty smart guys. You know the situation there. How do we, how do we manage that operation? In other words, we're going to destroy all the poppy as much as we can uh, and yet continue to try to retain the, the loyalty and friendship and support of the local population there. Uh, we don't want, you know, the only way an insurgency is going to survive there is if it has the support of the population. And that seems to be where we're driving at least some of them. Now that, that same area, uh, RC South, is uh, where we're going to see a lot of our, our sons and daughters going in the coming months. Uh, it's a real hotbed. But uh, th there's a real, uh, I don't know, it's a real paradox because what we're doing is the right thing. However, it seems to be because of the, the situation there and the great reliance on that economy, on the, on the poppy uh, cultivation, that we're maybe driving some people into the arms of the, uh, the Taliban and the insurgency. So could you help me with that and how we might, uh, we might not have that effect? Imagine if a group of cops from New York went to enter Iowa and started destroying people's cornfields. I mean, they would, those group of cops would take incoming fire. Um, that is what we're doing in Afghanistan. I've been on one of these eradication missions. A group of Kabul cops goes down to a place like uh, Urizgan, destroys the poppy fields. Whose poppy fields are destroyed? Not the, not the guy with the, uh, who's really the drug lord. It's the poor guy who can't pay the bribe to make sure. So our eradication first policy, on, and this is something the committee can certainly look into in more detail, I think is utterly crazy. It is the most counterproductive thing we're doing. There's a third of Afghanistan's GDP is derived from this. Millions of people derive their income from this, particularly in the areas where, as you say, so, uh, American sons and daughters are going to be going, putting themselves in harm's way. We really need to be rethinking this. General David Bano, I think, has said the smartest thing about what is, what is the mark of a successful drug policy in Afghanistan. It's not the number of hectares of poppy destroyed. It's the number of hectares of other crops that are, that are planted. That is the right way to be looking at it. We need to rethink and reframe the way we're doing our drug policy. Mr. Bergen? No, just, I, I agree absolutely with Peter. And this, this is where uh, the infrastructure reconstruction comes into play, too, because part of the reason it is difficult uh, for Afghan agriculturalists to make a living growing pomegranates or melons rather than poppy is uh, the insufficiency of the roads, the transportation. Uh, poppy has the extreme attraction of being a low weight, low volume, but uh, high profit margin uh, crop, which uh, simply can't be matched given the existing infrastructure and economic development by other crops. Is, uh, thank you, Mr. Lynch. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thanks Chairman. By. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Issa, you recognize Th Thank you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. Dr. Piller, uh, with your background in the agency, uh, you had the opportunity to work, obviously, with the intelligence community, somewhat with the military, and somewhat with the State Department. Would that be fair to say? Yes. So. Uh, just for the record, if, if I go to the State Department, they're going to always have a diplomatic answer that solves everything. You know, watch, watch and engage and talk. If I go to the intelligence community, they're going to say, watch, check, and do things clandestinely. And if I go to the military, they're going to say, we can fix the problem. We just need boots on the ground. Is that, is that fair to say that in every conflict, that is predictable from each of those three pillars of, of our national defense? Well, I think many years ago, Lord Salisbury had a, had a quotation that was a, sort of a paraphrase of what you just said, Mr. Issa, but it, it's probably not entirely fair in that I think the professionals in each of those parts of the uh, professional services in the executive branch know full well that they aren't the whole part of the story. Our military knows full well that there is an economic and diplomatic side. The intelligence people are there to serve the other sure. things. So, well, I asked the rhetorical question yeah. for, uh, for this reason. You mentioned, uh, just on, in response to a question, that uh, the, the image on the ground was that with our military attacks or our agency attacks uh, that we, we, we viewed their lives as cheap. In other words, that, that they had a downside 
for every upside. We're, we're, we're breaking up the leadership, but at the same time, mm -hmm. we're demonstrating that their lives are cheap and these raids come from the sky and kill with, uh, without even the, the uh, so-called honor of standing there and being mm -hmm. shot back at. Fair, fair assessment or fair paraphrasing? Yes, and I think that's reflected in the sorts of things as, as the poll result that Peter Bergen cited a couple of minutes okay. ago. Well, I'd, I'd like to use your uh, combined intellect of, I don't know, 600 points or so to, uh, uh, to, to, to ask a, a question, a, a, a bigger question, because I, I think, look, this was, uh, this was originally uh, the Russians, or the British's war, then it was the, the Russians' war, and, or Soviets' war, now I guess it's, it's our war. The last time when the Soviets were in, it was the Cold War, and we picked the other side. Uh, but we didn't pick it because we wanted to help the Afghans, we picked it because we wanted to hurt the Soviets. That's fair to say by all of you, the head shaking tells me I'm on the right track. Aren't we fairly in a Cold War, primarily with Iran, with Russia as a, 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 a satellite player? And if, if we are in a Cold War with Iran, then should we view Afghanistan through a who is our real enemy, who is our real friend, what do we have to defeat in order to win this, uh, this long conflict? And the same could be said if you were here talking about Hamas's activity in Gaza uh, or Hezbollah's activity in Lebanon. I, I, I'd pose almost the same question. If all of that is true, then how do we or do we change our, our uh, uh, direction in a way that causes us to be seen as reluctant to go to war, reluctant to kill, uh, believers that, uh, that in fact we engage only when we have to and only to the extent we have to. So I'm setting up that stage to say, is our national interest perhaps dealing with Iran and, and settling that, uh, dealing with perhaps Russia's uh, uh, support in a Cold War way? and. In a great, to a great extent, isn't the lack of world support in dealing with Afghanistan the result that there's a side that's on one side and therefore there's a side on another side? Well, I think what we have to do, Mr. Issa, is, is not reduce things to a strictly uh, red and white, green and white, Cold War kind of thing. Uh, the lines of conflict are much more complex than that. And I think your uh, mentioning Iran is, is a, this is the first time it came into this hearing. It's very appropriate you should raise it because Iran and the United States actually have some parallel interests in Afghanistan, as was demonstrated in the wake of uh, uh, our ouster of the Taliban with Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, and the diplomatic work that was done led by Ambassador Dobbins uh, with a lot of Iranian help in the bond process back in late 2001 to uh, start the political reconstruction process that led to the erection of the Karzai government. Yes, we have conflicting interests, but we've got a lot of parallel and uh, convergent interests, uh, particularly in this uh, country we're talking about today, Afghanistan. Uh, uh, Mr. Bergen? I think there's one area of common interest in particular that we have with Iran, which is the drug problem. Iran has the highest proportion of heroin users in the world. Um, and uh, you can imagine, uh, as there are baby steps taken to normalize relations with Iran, that that might be one of the first issues where there is some commonality, where we both have the same strategic interests about the drug problem in Afghanistan. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McHenry, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, thank you for uh, your leadership on this issue. Uh, two years ago, we traveled uh, together uh, to Pakistan and Afghanistan, and, and you raised those same issues then that are, I think are coming to light now, and I appreciate it. Um, we, we've got uh, – obviously, we're assessing the threat situation currently, but we also have an outline that's becoming more and more specific about – uh, President Obama's new new direction and uh, policy changes in terms of uh, our actions, in terms of troop levels and where those troops will be located um, in Afghanistan. And um, we're reading about outposts, that we're going to have more forward operating bases or outposts in the east and the south. And I wanted to get your perspective, all three of you, your perspective on on these outposts. I, um, 
you know, uh, Chairman Tierney uh, was able to uh, organize a trip to to just a very similar outpost that's being described now. It's going to be uh, quite prevalent along the border and in the east and the south. Um, and so I have an idea of what that looks like. Uh, but I want to know the security ramifications for this, uh, whether or not you think it's a good idea, the appropriate idea, the best way uh, in order to get a, a hold of this situation. We'll start with uh, Mr. Bergen. Thank you very much, sir. Well, I've been on a number of these small forward operating bases. Um, I mean, to, to give you an example, uh, one in Zabul where uh, 35 American soldiers, no electricity, no water, I mean, nothing. Um, if you're going to extend security to the population, you're going to have to do this. You're either not going to extend security to the population and secure the main cities, or you're going to, most 80% of Afghans don't live in the cities. So this is, I think, the only way to guarantee extending security. It's going to be very expensive in blood and treasure, I imagine. Okay. Mr. White? I agree. I, I think it's. I think it's essential. Uh, I would come back to the to the question that I asked earlier: is uh, it, where's the emphasis going to be? Is it going to be on securing major urban areas? Is it going to be on on village areas? Uh, and I would also make a parallel. I, I think. I think a useful parallel to what we've seen the Pakistani government try to do over the last few months in the Swat Valley in northern Pakistan, um, where they essentially were regularly able to clear areas with their military, but then they always returned to, uh, to sort of a, a PRT sort of location um, in an urban area, and the militants would just filter back into the villages, and their inability to forward deploy, to stay overnight in places, uh, and to actually gather intelligence and work on the front lines uh, made it practically impossible for them to secure what was their own territory in an environment where there is actually quite a lot of support for the Pakistani government. And I think that that same dynamic is in play, but even more complicated in Afghanistan, whether it is Afghan national troops uh, or, or U.S. troops, that the forward deployment is absolutely essential if they're going to actually secure the population. Mr. Pillow? I agree with my colleagues. If uh, we are going to do counterinsurgency and do it seriously, I think this is an essential part of it. Okay. Mr. White, you, you touched on uh, the provincial reconstruction teams. Uh, are we doing enough in terms of utilizing provincial reconstruction teams? Um, and if not, uh, what can we do to improve them and make them uh, m much more uh, effective? I'm actually going to defer my, to my colleagues on that uh, and their expertise. I think they spent more time there. Mr. Bergen? Afghanistan was the most under-resourced re under uh, post-World War II reconstruction effort the United States has ever engaged in, both in terms of boots on the ground and money spent. Um, so the more that we can do, the better. Now. That's the shortest, best answer I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pillar, you want to try to improve it? I, 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 can't, I can't improve on that, sir, no. Okay. Um, and again, um, just in terms of our approach here, you do think that the forward operating base is more engaged in, in sort of sparsely populated areas, but where insurgents are active. Uh, is the model similar to Iraq? Or, because in many ways, there are larger population centers that, that we are holding in Iraq as the model for these uh, operating bases, being engaged in the neighborhood. Is it much more complex because of how remote these areas are, Mr. Bergen? I, I mean, I, the short answer is yes. I'm not a, a military expert, but I will say one thing that, we, that the committee is in a position to order, or at least, uh, which is we need to secure the Kabul to Kandahar Road. This is the most important road in the country. Securing Route Irish between Baghdad uh, Airport and Baghdad City uh, sent a really important symbol. If we can secure this road much harder than Route Irish, because it's much longer, 300 miles, this is one of the things that we should really, really be focusing on. This is something that it, uh, all Afghans will understand. Hey, this road is back, on, back in business. This is the economic lifeline of the country. Right now, it, it would be suicidal for anybody in this room to take that road. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Mr. Welch, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a question to everyone, really. Uh, be brief, but uh, succinct. You've been terrific. I'm sorry I missed the early part of the hearing. Who is crossing the border from Pakistan to join the Afghan insurgency? We'll start with you, Mr. Bergen. Um, 
in terms of who's crossing the border, um, you know, I've interviewed a number of people, um, a number of failed suicide bombers, probably the best definition of failure imaginable. Uh, but um, you know, they're all they're Pakistani bumpkins, uh, Pashtun country bumpkins who've been told they're going to get the 72 versions. I mean, that's, that's the foot soldier. But then, of course, you know, the leadership of uh, the Taliban is, is in Pakistan, the Quetta Shura, the Peshawar Shura, Gulbuddin Hekmatya, uh, Haqqani, uh, the list goes on and on. They're all in Pakistan. So, uh, but they're not crossing. I mean, it's, they're sending foot soldiers across. But, so the leadership is there, um, and they are sending thousands of people across. And I, I think uh, Mr. White raised a very good point, which is a lot of this is about business. I mean, uh, you know, they may be dressed up to some degree with the Taliban and religious justification, but they're controlling not just the drug trade, but also all sorts of smuggling schemes and et cetera. And in a place with, you know, uh, very, very high unemployment, the uh, Pakistani Taliban, the Afghan Taliban is often the only job you can get. Okay. Do you, other gentlemen agree with that? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, when we were on our recent trip with uh, Chairman Tierney, <clears throat> one of the things in Afghanistan and Pakistan, one of the things that seemed the big, to be the biggest threat was the corruption in uh, uh, Afghanistan. I don't know if you've covered this, uh, Mr. Chairman. I came in late. <clears throat> but uh, we, we met some folks whose job in Afghanistan was to try to get business investment, if you can believe that. And the big issue was corruption. And what they described as two incidents that were pretty compelling. One is that if you wanted to get a driver's license in Kabul, you had to get the sign off of 21 different people and make a payment at each step of the way. If you were a trucker trying to deliver a load from the Iranian border to the other side of Afghanistan, you got stopped 27 times on average. Uh, and they were excited because the average had re gone down to something like 17. But these are by authorities. Uh, I'll start with you, Mr. Bergen, but if that is so uh, much a part of uh, the economy uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan, I mean, there is essentially no economy, drugs and corruption, uh, and that is, it seemed as though that was as big a threat to uh, the U.S. presence and success as anything else because we end up being seen as supporting the Karzai government, which is seen as either uh, tolerating or endorsing corruption. Uh, so it makes me skeptical about uh, our capacity militarily uh, to, to be successful. So perhaps Mr. Bergen and others down the line can respond to that. Uh, there's no <coughs> doubt that corruption is an enormous issue. Transparency International uh, judges Afghanistan to be basically running neck and neck with Somalia in terms of uh, corruption. So of the 175 countries it surveys, I think Afghanistan is like 172 terms of corruption. Um, it's an enormous issue. I, 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 it's kind of, I, I, what to do about it is, is probably uh, it's above my pay grade. I just, uh, you know, but I think the beginning is the United States government does know the names of the drug lords, and the, clearly that's the major part of the corruption that's going on. Uh, it is time to publish these names. Mr. Pilar, Mr. And uh, Mr. There's, White. There's no question that uh, the corruption is a major factor in the loss of popular support for the Karzai government, <clears throat> even though most Afghans, I venture to say, uh, would not want a return of the harsh kind of regime that the Taliban had prior to the fall of 2001. The Taliban have managed to exploit uh, the uh, resentment and disaffection with the Karzai government. And corruption is probably the single biggest ingredient in, right. in that Let me, view. before Mr. White, maybe you can take up this one. This is the dilemma that I experienced. If you have a military strategy that's to, trying to stabilize uh, the, ins the, the society so civil inst civic institutions can build up, but the civic institutions that we're in effect supporting are, are corrupt, then why is that not a dead end? And why does it not suggest that the uh, the, we should have a refined approach where our goal is to protect the American homeland and to rely more on intelligence and perhaps uh, military tactical strikes where there uh, is a, a high value target or an emerging uh, base threat uh, as opposed to an occupational force with a nation building goal. That's the dilemma for me anyway and, and uh, I'll start with you Mr. White. Uh, do we have to face that as our choice? To some extent, I think I think we will. I, I think uh, there has been and is a healthy reevaluation going on about our actual objectives in Afghanistan. 
but I think we also need to listen to those who say that uh, it's very difficult to pursue a pure counterterrorism objective without thinking in a counterinsurgency sort of uh, sort of framework because you cannot get the kind of local intelligence you need. Um, you cannot regularly disrupt the kind of havens as you need to uh, from the air or with an occasional strike. It's very, very difficult and that the actual presence of safe havens on the ground is something that requires state presence. It's, it's something that requires building institutional capacity and over the long term having a legitimate state. And I'm sympathetic to that argument. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Burton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I won't uh, take that long. I just, I got here a little bit late, so I apologize if I'm being redundant with this question. But uh, in in uh, Iraq, uh, we had substantially more troops, and it took a considerable length of time for us to stabilize that country and to train the troops so they could uh, take care of the problem themselves. And uh, President Obama is going to bring our troops home relatively soon because of the transition to the uh, Iraqi troops. And I know you don't have a crystal ball, but uh, Afghanistan is a much larger country. It's, the terrain is much different, and this guerrilla war that's being fought by the Taliban and its fellow travelers appears to be a more difficult situation than we had in Iraq. So based upon this information, how many troops, I know I've, Mirtha said we, we need 600,000, but how many troops and how long do you anticipate we'll have to stay there and will we, always, will we have to have a permanent, a permanent number of troops there like we have in Korea and, and Japan and elsewhere to, uh, to augment uh, the uh, Afghani forces uh, once they're ready to uh, take up the slack? Uh, well, Mr. Burton, we, I think we did address it. You have it. to speak up. Uh, we did address it a little bit uh, earlier, uh, perhaps before you were here, but uh, the, the one uh, uh, comment I alluded to earlier was General McNeil, one of our former commanders uh, of the International Security Assistance Force, and he was speaking of uh, several hundred thousand. I think he used the, the, the number 400,000. And also, he had a time frame, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was in the you know several years. I don't, you know, successful counterinsurgency does not have to mean, shouldn't mean a permanent presence. I mean, the kind of thing we've had in Japan and Korea is because of other things having to do with, you know, interstate threats. Um, but suffice it to say, it's uh, in the hundreds of thousands and multiple years, exactly how many, uh, it'd be hard to say, uh, if full successful counterinsurgency was to be uh, undertaken in Afghanistan against the background of all the factors that you appropriately mentioned, size, terrain, and so on. Can I, can I add to that? And I, there's a big difference between Afghanistan and Iraq, which is um, support for international forces in Afghanistan is very, very high. The idea was that Afghanistan was going to be the graveyard of empires and we'd be greeted with flowers in Iraq, and it was exactly the reverse. Afghans uh, wanted us to be, be there at very, very high levels. Uh, I can't think of a single Muslim nation which in, in 2006 had a more favorable view of the United States, at 85% 80, favorable. The numbers have dropped to 47% today in terms of favorable views of the United States. That's still half the population is basically in, in favor of us being there. That's better than Iraq ever was, uh, even at the, the height of you know, the early stages of the occupation. So the center of gravity in any, any insurgency is the population. The population is still at least half in our favor. And one other data point which is important, when we invaded Iraq, four million, Af four million Iraqis left the either left the country or were displaced internally. Four million Afghans have returned to Afghanistan since 9-11. People don't vote with their feet unless they think there's a future there. So Afghanistan, you're completely right about all the problems. But there are also some significant factors in our favor suggesting a possible outcome which will to all our liking. If, if I might just add to that, and those are all very important points that Peter Bergen made, but. Uh, related to the question of greater international support is something that hasn't yet come up in this hearing, and that is the role of our NATO allies. And as uh, the members are well aware, this has been uh, a rather big issue between us and our allies uh, uh, with regard to the size of their contribution and what conditions or lack of conditions are placed on their troops that are there. Uh, Secretary Gates and others, of course, have been working hard on this. Uh, but if you're talking about a long-term counterinsurgency, this is another dimension uh, 
despite the, the uh, as Peter accurately points out, the greater degree of uh, uh, international support for the effort. That's another consideration that has to be uh, brought to bear. I, I would just say very briefly that in comparison with, with Iraq, I think that the, the number of troops required to do the same amount of work in Afghanistan will in many ways be higher for any, any given territory, not only because of the development environment in Afghanistan, but because of the difference in a, the tribal structure, which is very pronounced. And in Iraq, in, in places, it was possible to get a few big men on board and to negotiate on that basis. And that is very, very difficult to do in the Pashtun areas, uh, both the Pakistani tribal areas and in Afghanistan, because uh, a leader is only a first among equals, and, uh, and there are a number of shifting alliances that make it very difficult to, uh, to make deals with large blocks um, at one time. And I think that, that's, gonna, that's gonna be an important factor. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Uh, Mr. White, I'm aware that you need to be out of here by 11.40 or, or sooner and that you're going to walk with your feet, vote with your feet, and that's, that's fine. I think everybody <laughs> is fine with that. So whenever you feel that you have to depart, uh, please go with our appreciation for your contributions here today and don't hesitate at all. We're very grateful that you were able to spend time with us. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think we're going to spend a few more moments uh, here, if that's fine with our witnesses, uh, on that and just do another round or if so many people want to ask. Uh, let me start by uh, saying there's one issue, I think. We, we all think that if anything is going to be resolved in Afghanistan, it requires something to be resolved in Pakistan. Uh, that's where al-Qaeda and the al-Qaeda affiliate uh, leadership is. Uh, and they are, as, as Mr. Bergen says, sending people over into Afghanistan, but also presumably sending people to London and Madrid and, <laughs> and elsewhere. In Pakistan, we seem to have a very difficult time focusing all of the uh, players who are leaders in, in the Pakistani government and military on recognizing that strategically the threat at the current moment is not necessarily India, uh, but is in fact the existential threat of, of terror and Taliban and, and Al Qaeda uh, inwardly to them as well. Can you envision a way that the United States aid to Pakistan be conditioned on certain uh, benchmarks or uh, metrics or whatever so that uh, we can say that if certain things don't improve, maybe the funding won't continue going because without resolving that problem, you can't really resolve Afghanistan? Mr. Pillar, Dr. Pillar? Uh, I can envision it. It will be difficult to achieve uh, because al although we might not have put explicit conditions on aid so far of the sort that you're talking about, Mr. Chairman, uh, to be quite blunt, you know, the Pakistanis have played games with us uh, in terms of you know, making perhaps more of a show of um, going after elements we're most concerned with in the Northwest, uh, which is not to say that they haven't done real operations and indeed have incurred substantial casualties but uh, then have you know, brought things to a halt and have reached these various uh, agreements and truces, whether it's with the people in SWAT or elsewhere, that have fallen short of our objectives. Uh, the Pakistanis are very adept at playing these um, sorts of games uh, with, with foreign governments, including us, uh, in doing just enough to keep us satisfied while doing other things that if we know, knew everything that was going on, would be, uh, we'd be dissatisfied with. This is the same thing that's taken place for years with regard to their activity in Kashmir and the cross-border operations. So I guess the question is why should we continue to fund them at, at fairly significant amounts if we're getting uh, doublespeak and avoidance back? Uh, it's a legitimate question, but as I suggested in my earlier comments, we have a variety of uh, interest in Pakistan, uh, many of them related to the overall stability of, of the Pakistani state. and their cooperation, their willingness and ability to cooperate on many other things besides just, you know, going after the Taliban of the Northwest. Mm -hmm. You feel the same, Mr. White? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I think that, um, I know there will be talk about conditioning aid, and I think that those are, those are very helpful discussions. Uh, but I think from the perspective of the United States government, uh, what the United States can do is to more, more wisely target the aid that it is giving and the assistance that it is giving. Um, and that, we could talk about what that looks like in development aid, but for example, in military aid, um, a lot of our funding has either gone directly to the Pakistani government um, in a fairly unaccountable way, or it, our military sales have gone through the, the FMF process um, and in a way that is both rather slow and not always uh, targeted to what, uh, to what our major joint objectives are. And so I think there's a real need to look at those mechanisms and say, are there mechanisms by which, for example, the relevant combatant commander could sit down with the chief of army staff and look at 
a set of equipment, a set of training uh, that meets counterinsurgency objectives and so forth, um, and then have a mechanism by which that equipment can, can move through the system in a way that is not just the Pakistanis sort of checking things off a list that, that they would like to see. So there are ways to target our assistance, and I think that that w could address a, a good part of the, of the problem that we've been facing. Mr. Bergen, where did most of the opium grown in Afghanistan end up? In Europe, I mean, 95 percent of it. Europe. And some in Iran? And, uh, all, uh, some to Iran and uh, Central Asia, but I mean, in terms of the West, mostly Europe. And besides the United States, who else is very uh, interested in the stability of the South Asia region? Well, I mean, the United Kingdom, NATO, our NATO allies. Um, India, India, Iran, <laughs> stands. Yeah, lots of people, China. Is it striking China. to any of you that we, we've, uh, we've had so very little uh, effort at engaging all of those parties in some sort of contact effort? I mean, we've done it at marginal levels in terms of money or whatever, but in terms of really uh, working with those people and trying to come up with some strategic answer to this? Is it striking at all that there seems to be a paucity of effort there? Indeed, but I think Ambassador Holbrook will be changing that. Yeah. And uh, you know, I think it, it has been striking to me. I think it's particularly important to engage the Gulf states uh, because they have an enormous influence uh, in Pakistan because of their financial position, even though it's been recently uh, weakened somewhat. Uh, and there is a tremendous amount of transport, uh, transit by the Pashtun population in Pakistan and Afghanistan through the Gulf states. So I think that's those are very important players to engage. I think you've correctly identified a possible missed opportunity, Mr. Chairman, as it relates, for example, to the Central Asian states, uh, which have ideas about uh, energy uh, uh, resources being exported uh, through Afghanistan and Pakistan. Thank you very much. Mr. Flake. <clears throat> Mr. Bergen, you mentioned uh, the, the necessity to uh, ensure that the elections are, or uh, we have sufficient security for the elections. and that, is, is reason enough, I guess, to send troops now before we have uh, an overall plan. Uh, we at least need that. Are 17,000 sufficient to help provide the necessary security? And are, is that, uh, from your knowledge, is, 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 do we have that in mind in terms of deployment of a lot of those 17? I, my understanding is they're going to specific uh, um, areas and uh, are they going to need to be deployed further out or are we going to need additional resources to make sure that election is uh, goes off as well as it can? I, I would make two comments. I mean, Iraq in 2005 was far more violent than Afghanistan is in 2009 and the United States was able to secure that election. Um, so I do not doubt that for one day we can secure the whole country so that there is a successful election. Where those troops are going in terms of their missions, obviously I'm not privy to that kind of information, but the area where you need to secure is the south. Uh, the north is not an issue, and that's where, of course, these soldiers are going. So I'm presuming that two birds will be killed with one stone in terms of both securing the south and also securing the election day. Right. Yeah, just to further on the election, um, obviously we're, we're a little less uh, excited about another four years of, of Karzai, but is there any other viable option at this point in your view? That is a very good question. Um, you know, he has a huge incumbency advantage. You know, uh, Karzai won the last election for 55 percent of the vote against a dozen other candidates, and I don't need to tell the politicians on, <laughs> here that that is a pretty successful outcome. It's better than Obama did against uh, one serious challenger in the recent presidential. So he is still a popular guy. Um, and um, I think the, the maneuvers that he's been making with this election are actually rather skillful. I mean, he's completely wrong-footed his opponents by saying we might do it earlier. They can't uh, organize themselves. Uh, he, uh, so I, I think you know, we will have a, a second pre presidential term with, with President Karzai, uh, who has been, you know, the, the idea that he's just mayor of Kabul, I've always been somewhat suspicious of. He's, he's been pretty adept about maneuvering people out of uh, office who are potential threats. Mm -hmm. uh, he's quite a deaf politician. Of course, you've met him, so you can uh, make your own judgment. Mr. White, do you agree? I, I do. I do. Mr. Pillar? Yes. So another four years, and that's the, as far as our policy or what we're doing, uh, we really have no choice but to move ahead um, and uh, hope for the best of a second term, I guess. That, does everyone agree? Um, with regard to security in the election, is that, do uh, you also agree that that, we, we face a situation here that is uh, less volatile than it was in Iraq, and we're still able to succeed there? Um, do you see, foresee a successful election there? 
Well, I, I think Peter makes the basic point here that you know, what we did in Iraq was you know, lock down the country for a day. Um, and I, I have confidence, as he did, that uh, we could do it in Afghanistan, too. But that's, that's still just a day. Yeah, I think it's it's probably possible, but exceptionally difficult. Uh, I've recently been an observer in elections in Bangladesh and in Pakistan uh, last year, and even in those environments in the rural areas, it is it is very very difficult to provide security, and the best that the government can usually provide is is uh, in many of those countries, it's a lone police officer with a 1950s rifle, uh, who's uh, who's falling asleep by the side of the polling station. Um, so I'm, it's possible, but uh, I think we have to keep our expectations very low. Mr. Piller, at this point, there are no significant blocks of, uh, of uh, people or groups that have said that they're not going to participate. Uh, uh, in the, could you repeat in, in the, the question? Election, in the election, uh, are there significant blocks that are threatened to uh, to uh, boycott the elections at this not point? Not that I'm aware of. Peter probably is better able to answer that I mean, question than I, I am. Uh, I, I think or, after or Karzai's Josh. posturing yesterday, you know, Ashraf Ghani and others said that they couldn't participate in an election that was held on on the spring timetable, mm -hmm. but uh, but that's still that's still posturing at this point, and that hasn't sorted itself out yet. And in the end, you expect Mr. Bergen all uh, significant blocks to participate. I do. You know, the turnout in um, the last time there was a turnout of 70 percent in the United States was in 1900. Uh, uh, you know, there was a 70 percent turnout in the 2004 election. It went very very smoothly. Uh, obviously, it's not going to go quite as smoothly this time, but I anticipate high turnout and a relatively successful outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Welch, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. The, uh, I want to go back to the cross-border effect, uh, and I'll start again with you, Mr. Bergen. Is the cross-border effect uh, coming from Afghanistan as bad as the Afghan government portrays it? I think that's a, a very important question. Let's do the thought experiment where there was no cross-border traffic. Afghanistan would still have a lot of problems. They would have the drug problem. They would have local Taliban. Um, so Rand did a study of the 90 insurgencies since World War II. If you have a safe haven, you know, half the time the insurgents win. I mean, it's a, it's a game changer. So. The problem is that... Wait, what's the game changer? The game changer a game changer is continuing to have a safe haven. Uh, clearly, that operates in the insurgents' favor. But if they didn't have the safe haven, the problems of the Taliban would not completely disappear. They wouldn't have command and control uh, you know, from across the border, but you still have the drug trade, you still have local Taliban. The problem would not go away. The Afghan government you know, tends to be very critical of Pakistan, we know that. But you know, they, they have their own problems. Okay, Mr. Pilar. Well, I think when you hear uh, President Karzai complaining mightily about uh, the Pakistanis, it's, it's uh, partly uh, to um, deflect attention from the, uh, the internal problems that we've been discussing. But the, the reality, I, I agree totally with what Peter said. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about Lashkari Taiba. Am I pronouncing that right? Yes. Yep. Uh, can you just describe who they are and what threats they pose? You know, a lot of these names just kind of run over the surface, and we get a little bit confused by it. And in the, in the and when we're too general, uh, it, it it means that we don't get specific on practical responses. So, uh, Mr. Pilar, Lashkar-e Taiba or LT uh, is a, an Islamist uh, Pakistani group uh, that has gotten certainly in the past, and there's a question about how much it still has in, in the present. Uh, cooperation and sponsorship from elements of the Pakistani government itself, which saw it as a, a useful tool, particularly with regard to confronting the Indians in Kashmir and keeping an insurgency in, in Kashmir brewing. Um, uh, since then, uh, and, and partly because of the pressure that our government has placed on the Pakistanis uh, not to do business with this group, um, uh, which is, let's be quite blunt, a loathsome terrorist group that uh, is appropriately on all of our terrorist lists, and, uh, and it is appropriate for us to place such pressure on the Pakistanis. Uh, the, the official sponsorship um, is no longer there. Um, the remaining question is uh, to what degree there may be individuals or elements, uh, particularly in the Pakistani military, that may have some continued relationship with the group. But, for any Pakistani military or civilian, um, uh, they have to consider that uh, Lashkari Al Taiba is now doing things in Pakistan uh, that um, have have been uh, as much of a problem as as a resource. 
we have, of course, the... So, the I mean, that goes back to what Chairman Tierney was talking about earlier, where Pakistan uh, has a threat, an existential threat from the terrorism that's starting to occur in its own it, boundaries. It, it, it might not be an existential threat in the sense that you know, we're going to mm -hmm. see, we have a chance of seeing next year LT taking over the government and the nuclear weapons, that sort of thing. That's not going to happen. Uh, however, insofar as it becomes a preoccupation and a diversion for any Pakistani leader, it's an important thing for us. We've seen the Mumbai bombings, of course, in which they are a prime suspect, and, and I alluded to the, uh, the very sophisticated attack in Lahore yesterday uh, against the Sri Lankan uh, cricket team, and it's still a matter of speculation. There haven't been any claims of responsibility, but I would put LT at the top of the list of suspects, as many Pakistanis are indeed doing uh, today. Do, do, does their agenda, the LT agenda, extend beyond uh, its views on India-Pakistan relations and Kashmir? They, they share the general um, ideology in many respects of bin Laden's uh, uh, al-Qaeda, uh, although operationally they have been focused uh, more on their region, on Kashmir, and now in Pakistan itself. Just to speculate a bit more about yesterday's attack, I mean, if it was lashkar e taiba and the question is, all right, why did they do it? Uh, my speculation would be to discredit and dis destabilize the, the civilian government led by Zardari, uh, perhaps even in the hope that a new military government might put more uh, continued sympathizers to, to them and, and their cause back in power, as opposed to uh, Zardari and the uh, Pakistan People's Party. And thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bergen, who makes up the insurgency uh, in the Swat Valley? Uh, well, it's uh, Pakistani Taliban. Um, I mean, that's, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I wish Mr. White was still here because he would have a much more uh, sophisticated answer. But I mean, it's, it's essentially the Pakistani Taliban. And, and their goals are what, as you see it? Well, I mean, it's of Sharia law. Um, I mean, we've seen a lot of the, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's a replica of uh, what happened in Afghanistan pre-9-11, essentially. And, uh, you know, President Zadari, as you know, uh, indicated that he thought the West should have a greater uh, sophisticated understanding of the goals uh, with respect to in the imposition of Sharia law. What's your take on that? If you ask almost any Muslim, are you in favor of Sharia law, most Muslims will say yes, because it's, 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 it's in principle, that's it's the details of what that Sharia law might look like. Is it, you know, Taliban or is it something much, much, much less onerous? Um, so, I mean, there's nothing necessarily wrong with people who want to install some form of Sharia law. It's a question of degree. The, the other quite the issue that SWAT raises is, is doing these kinds of deals at all a good thing? Now, obviously, Pakistan makes its own judgments about this. But if we're prepared to do side deals with the Afghan Taliban, why can't the Pakistani government uh, do, their, do deals with the Pakistani Taliban on their own territory? Uh, that's something we need to think about. And, well, but, we I, have also, but they can if they want to, right? Well, I mean, but without, like, they, they, obviously they can, but I mean, we tend to be very critical of these deals. I think appropriately so, because often the deals basically give the breathing room for, for the militants to, to regroup. But you've, we've got to understand the Pakistani government does these deals, I think, because they have no other options. Usually when they go into these areas, it's a military defeat. The much vaunted Pakistani army has never really won any kind of significant war it's ever been involved in. And it's not winning a war against the insurgency on its western and northern borders. And so these peace deals are really certifications of military failure rather than anything else. And a couple of other relevant points. One, the Pakistani military is not trained, equipped, or organized to do counterinsurgency in the northwest. They are trained, equipped, and organized to conduct uh, armored battles against the Indians uh, along their border. Uh, and secondly, a lot of the areas we talked about, you know, the, the, the Pakistani central government basically has never controlled it. That's certainly true of the Fatah. Yeah, it's which a very small percentage of the 170 million or so people in Pakistan, right? That, that's, that's correct. What's the population out there? Three million in Fatah. Yeah. Um, now... So how, how, how in the world do we control that? I mean, it's, it's pretty mountainous out there. I mean, there, there's a level of presumption in, this, in a lot of our discussions uh, about our capacity to affect uh, what is, I guess, extraordinarily rural, extraordinarily decentralized, uh, uh, area of the world uh, where there's some potential, uh, is a potential, is it a threat to our country? I think that's a fair observation and on the Pakistani end it's not just a question of willingness or just a question of capability, it's a little bit of both. 
uh, a lot of capability. We, we like to think of it more as, well, the, the Pakistanis ought to do more, and they should do more. Well, that's probably true, but there, uh, there's a, a large capability question as well. The one other point, if I could just add, Mr. Welch, uh, to get on the table about the Pakistani Taliban and, and your original question to, to Peter is, when we talk about the Pakistani Taliban, we are not talking about a single unified group. You know, we are right. talking about a number of elements, uh, particularly in, in the Fatah, uh, each of which independently control chunks of it. Uh, Masood and others uh, have, have pieces of it, and sometimes they are, have been conflicting yeah. uh, and, and contending among themselves for pieces well, of it, territory. Is it control. your view that the, those various elements uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the Fatah well, region uh, have as a goal more autonomy in that region, or do they want to take over the, uh, the Pakistani government? Oh, I think it's much more the, 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 the former, uh, to, to maintain and solidify their autonomy. And I think most of them are smart enough to realize uh, they aren't close to uh, taking over Pakistan. But All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Welch. And, and thank uh, both of our witnesses here. I'm, I'm still left with the, with the question I started with, that if we were to uh, get some sort of uh, government stabilized in Afghanistan and get Pakistan to deal with uh, their situation, uh, that it, there would still be some ungoverned areas in both Afghanistan and Pakistan to which uh, elements un, uh, uncharitable to our, our interests would reside, or they could mm -hmm. go to Yemen uh, and whatever. And we're left with the question is, are we going to keep sending in troops after troops after troops, or do we have another way of, of dealing with this? But uh, I thank you for your contributions and all the information that you shared with us today. It's certainly helpful. Uh, it's assistant to us to uh, sort of focus our attention on this and decide as uh, this country is about to embark on a, an expenditure of human treasure and, uh, and financial treasure as well. So uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Flake. And uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Then. Anything to make it easier means you're making my life easier. Joe simplifies his life with the Contour Meter from Bayer, the only meter that can be easily personalized and in four vibrant colors. My meter absolutely adapts to me and my lifestyle. Being outside of the box is my simple win. The Contour Meter from Bayer, in four vibrant colors. All right, I got one too. My name is Mohamed Panjawani, and uh, I'm from Houston, Texas. And uh, I'm uh, working for an engineering firm. We design oil refineries and a lot of procurement and civil work around the globe. <laughs> this is what, exactly what I wanted. Before ITT Tech, I was working uh, two jobs and still couldn't accomplish and didn't enjoy what I was doing. I was doing customer service. That was OK, but that wasn't really my dream. I always felt something was missing. He succeeded, and we're, here we are today, and everything's just worked out wonderful. That's what I tell him all the time. Be, be hardworking, be honest, sincere, and all your dreams will come true.
We are educators helping people build a foundation for the rest of their lives. ITT Technical Institute, education for the future. Call 1-800-488-3652 or visit us on the web. Get an education that can help you reach your goals. ITT Tech has information on financial aid for those who qualify. Call 1-800-488-3652. Hello, I'm Patrick Cox, founder of Taxmasters. For years now, I've been telling you that if you're being audited, have several years of unfiled tax returns, or the IRS is coming to your home or place of business, we can help. The IRS said we owed over $50,000. Taxmasters fought hard, and the auditor agreed. We owed no additional taxes. We'll get between you and the IRS. We'll make sure they treat you fairly and treat you with respect. Don't wait weeks for an appointment. Our former IRS agents and tax professionals are ready to help you now. Call 1-877-469-4568. Taxmasters, we solve your tax problem. Tuesday on an all-new Recreation Nation. Here we go. I join a team of renegades for my very first soapbox race. What a piece of... Man, I don't know. You gonna race this thing tomorrow? Then, the annual fruitcake talk. Why fruitcakes? Most people don't really care for them. Do one! Nothing but net. Yes! Recreation Nation with Dave Mortal. Tuesday at 10 after Dirty Jobs. It's all new on Discovery. What stops the roll? Just my head. Oh, yeah. Okay. If credit card debt is taking over your life, please write down this number and call us today. I see people every day that are on the brink. They're going to go over the edge and at the bottom is a bankruptcy and we pull them back and they appreciate it. Call for Care One Credit Counseling Services to help put an end to the worry, the collection calls, the sleepless nights without bankruptcy. You do get to consolidate your payments. You don't have to worry about making one payment a month instead of making three, four or five. A Care One credit counselor knows how to listen and can help you reduce your payments, pay off debts faster, and stay out of debt. People are truly amazed when they call us and they see what we can do to help them. I mean, the relief in their voice is just, it makes the job worthwhile. Please call today to speak to a Care One credit counselor. It's 15 minutes that can change your life. And the sooner you call, the easier it is. Care One for you. It is your path out. Unsolved riddles of the past. Jack the Ripper is a challenge for us. Have investigators digging deep. What's inside it? We don't know. Now, high-tech breakthroughs bring new insight. If he'd had all the information that we could give him now, he'd have got it. Revealing treasures. <gasps> Unmasking the mysteries. Oh, beautiful. This is a good evidence that KV-63 is for the mother. Unearthing ancient secrets. Mondays at 9 on the Science Channel. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, main engine start, zero, and liftoff. Delta Beginning in 1996, a small fleet of spacecraft, both orbiters and landers.